this week at Starbase. Booster 12 and Ship 30 are de-stacked at the launch site, Booster 14 is sent to the Massey Outpost to begin its test campaign, and the delivery and assembly of components for Tower 2's orbital launch mount gets underway. Now let's dig into this week's update. Friday morning at the launch complex began with a short run of concrete placed at the base of the new tower with the pour wrapping up within an hour. At the rocket garden, Booster 4's remaining aft section, which carried the early Booster's hydraulic power units that caused so much trouble on Starship's first flight, was pulled off its stand for scrapping. Construction continued at the office building expansion that connects it to the Star Factory building, with more steel being raised and installed. The chopsticks on Tower 1 at the launch site were opened from around Starship 30 and raised up to their launch and catch position. After spending some time open at the top of the tower, the chopsticks closed, lowered back down, and affixed to the ship's hard points. On Sunday, the ship's stand at the launch complex was moved to the launch tower as workers prepared to de-stack the ship from the booster. Work continued at the office building expansion on Monday as another column was lifted into place, further expanding the footprint of the structure. Rebar cages for foundation piles were lowered into place in the former location of the vertical storage tanks at the launch site, as the propellant storage farm continues to be built out to support both launch pads. Workers continued to prepare Ship 30 for destacking, with the tower hydraulics retracting the ship quick disconnect interface panel from the Starship. Crews on the ship quick disconnect arm extended the work platform and began taping over the ship's ports to help keep them clean and free from water and debris. Once their work on the tower arm was complete, the arm was swung out and away, clearing the way for destacking. Starship 30 was lifted off booster 12 about an hour later. The chopstick slowly lifted the ship off the hot stage ring, swung it over toward the waiting ship stand, and lowered it down into place. The ship quick disconnect arm then swung back toward the booster. Meanwhile, workers began taking down the safety netting between the first and second sections of the new launch tower. It's likely that the welders have completed their work closing the gaps in the higher tower segments. As twilight set in at Starbase, the LR-11000 was used to remove the hot stage ring from Booster 12, completing D-stack operations and giving workers access to the systems at the top of the booster. Tuesday marked the start of a new month and saw the booster transport stand that was at the pad begin the return trip from the launch site to Sanchez and make its way up Highway 4 in the quieter hours of the night. More components for the orbital launch mount at Pad B were delivered to Starbase in the morning. These squared off components appear to be corner pieces for the launch mount. The new launch mount will span a large flame trench and appears to be a complete redesign from the existing mount. The booster cryoproofing stand was brought out of storage from Sanchez and rolled down Highway 4 to the build site before coming to a stop in the ring yard area. The booster cryoproofing stand was then brought into Mega Bay 1 as workers prepared to bring Booster 14 to the Massey outpost. The booster was loaded onto the cryoproofing stand at the front of the bay and workers began to secure the rocket to the stand. Booster 14 was brought out of Mega Bay 1 on Wednesday morning and staged in the ring yard to wait for rollout. The cryoproofing stand and booster were brought back in front of Mega Bay 1 a few hours later where they would continue to wait. The Saren CC8800 crane was laid down at the launch site. It's not clear if it's undergoing maintenance or if the crane will soon be departing Starbase. It hasn't lifted anything since it was reconfigured. Scrap from Booster 4's aft section was shipped out of Starbase. Workers made clever use of the hydraulic power unit covers as buckets to carry some of the smaller pieces away. After the sun had gone down at the launch site, the chopsticks were raised up to the catching position on the launch tower. The arms were then swung around before turning back to the side and being lowered down to the ground. The Starship static fire test stand was brought out from Sanchez and staged alongside Booster 14 to join its rollout to the Massey outpost. 
Booster 14 and the ship's static fire stand began their journey to Massey's just after midnight on Thursday, rolling up Highway 4 on the long journey to the site and making their way there in about two hours. Over at the build site, the Block 2 ship lifter was lowered to the ground in Mega Bay 2's doorway. We also spotted an SPMT rolling into the Star Factory. The SPMT soon left Star Factory empty-handed though and headed over to a staging area in the ring yard. Getting a bit of help from one of the Grove Cranes, the ship lifter was laid flat on the Mega Bay 2 floor. Less than 30 minutes later, the Block 2 ship lifter was raised back up with a newly added load cell between the crane block and the rigging. The Can Crusher's top hat assembly was removed from the test article at the Massey Outpost, while Booster 14 awaits its first round of cryoproofing. A tanker load of potable water was delivered to the launch complex, reloading the pad's detonation suppression system. The DSS uses inert nitrogen gas and water to prevent flammable gases from igniting under the booster. Another Block 2 Starship lifting jig was delivered to the build site. After rolling in, the newly delivered rigging was brought into Star Factory. With the vehicle now de-stacked and waiting for a modified launch license from the FAA, Starship 30's forward flaps were retracted into the stowed position. Two new pieces of machinery were brought into Star Factory in the afternoon. The purpose of these new machines is currently unknown, so if you have any idea what these things are for, let us know in the comments. As workers continue to assemble the second launch pad, a new corner piece was delivered to Starbase. Switching over to the Cape in Florida on Friday, ahead of the imminent launch of the Crew-9 mission to the International Space Station, Falcon 9 and Crew Dragon Freedom were raised vertical at Space Launch Complex 40. Falcon 9 Booster 1085 and Crew Dragon lifted off from Slick 40 on Saturday, taking Nick Haig and Alexander Gorbanov to the ISS. When the mission ends, Nick and Alexander will also return with Barry Wilmore and Sunita Williams who flew on Boeing Starliner back in June. The booster made a successful return to landing zone 1, touching down with its characteristic sonic boom. The second stage de-orbit burn was slightly less successful though, forcing the stage to splash down outside its designated landing area. Falcon 9 remains grounded until the source of the issue is found and resolved. Vulcan Centaur was rolled out to Space Launch Complex 41 for the Certification 2 mission on Monday and would ultimately launch on Friday. Since Dream Chaser wasn't going to be ready in time, the vehicle was loaded with a dummy payload and ULA experiments. Mobile Launcher 1 was rolled back from SLC 39B to the Vehicle Assembly Building on Thursday following several months of integration testing and upgrades for the Artemis 2 mission, which is currently scheduled to launch no earlier than September 2025. The Mobile Launcher made the journey at its characteristically slow pace, taking about 8 hours with several scheduled stops during the trip. Later on outside the Vehicle Assembly Building, Mobile Launcher 1's crew access arm was extended. And there you have it, another SpaceX and Starbase weekly update brought to you by Lab Padre. Don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button if you haven't already guys, and we'll see you next week. Thanks for watching, Lab Padre out.